Washington Enterprise has called for major policy reforms to rid the country of poverty, unemployment and excessive inequality at the launch of its Growth Agenda series of policy reports. Compiled over two years by academic and policy experts, CDE's Growth Agenda draws on international and South African evidence to focus on five priority areas for policy reform. That's jobs, accelerating inclusive growth, skills, cities and the business government relationship. And joining me to unpack this is the Center for Development and Enterprises, Anne Bernstein. And thanks so much for your time today. That's a long list of issues and I wish we had more time to unpack all of them. But let's just take a step back and talk about how the report itself was comp compiled and what question were you trying to answer? Well, look, we were very concerned about two years ago that South Africa has the highest recorded unemployment rate in the world. We're a complete global outlier. And we felt too few people were focusing on growth mm. and the importance of high growth and job-rich growth in order to deal with all our development challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And so we wanted to really think through what are the five priorities we, would, we wanted to, we thought would help South Africa get to a high growth, job-rich path mm -hmm. and to get People debating and arguing about this, I'm sure we haven't got it all right, mm. but we wanted to get people talking about the right issues in an environment in which there were lots of facts and to try and get back to the very high growth we need in order to deal with our population and our challenges. Growth itself uh, is not uncontested. Um, we know that we've had, uh, you know, about probably about a decade of what they were calling jobless uh, growth. H how do we work around the conventional definition of what growth is and the kind of growth that South Africa needs? Well, firstly, we didn't have jobless growth. This is a myth. We, in the 2000s, when we did really well before the, the, the crash the in 2008, South Africa added about 2,000 new jobs. Most of those were for skilled people, not for the majority of our workforce who through no fault of their own are unskilled. So I don't believe in uh, jobless growth. The facts don't bear it out. And I think South Africans are seeing now what it means to live with very low or stagnant growth. So I think this is a very weak argument. We desperately need growth. The NDP in 2012 said that we needed 5.4% growth per annum to get to 11 million new jobs and the kind of society we all want by 2030. Well, we're nowhere near that. And if we were to start tomorrow, we would need over 6% growth per annum in order to achieve the NDP goals. So I'm convinced that growth is good for South Africa, yeah. but unlike many businessmen who just say we want growth, we're saying we have to get job-rich growth. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to get to, is what would that growth need to look like? Because if we're going to have growth that only absorbs skilled people, um, then it doesn't help us break this stranglehold of poverty and unemployment and, of course, inequality as well. So how do we get there? Do we need a reindustrialization, as, as some people are talking about? What, what is it that we need? Well, look, for 20 years, South Africa's had what you could call a high-skill, high-wage growth path, which is fine if you had a high-skilled workforce. We don't. I think that experiment has failed, and as I said earlier, we're a complete global outlier. We're not just a little bit different. Mm. We, most people, most countries have about 60% of their workforce who are employed. South Africa has 42%. This is an enormous difference, about 6 million jobs in the yeah. South African context. So we're saying we have to rethink our policy. And most important of all, we have to become a much more labor-intensive economy, which means you have to change some laws and regulations. And there's a big opportunity. The location of low-skill manufacturing is moving away from China. Yeah. There's estimates of about 80 million jobs that are going to move. Imagine if South Africa could get a small fraction, fraction of, of those yeah. jobs. So these are low-skill jobs. They people making t-shirts, they're people making shirts, um, they're sort of compiling various kind of products, yeah. but these are jobs for the workforce that we have. And so we've come up with a proposal which says, let's experiment and try and get some of those jobs. Because if you get some jobs, even if it, the work is for export, yeah. we'll increase our exports, we will employ a whole lot of people, and see the best route out of poverty is to get a job.
Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Let's talk a little bit then about some of the proposals um, that you've put forward. You said, you know, uh, this is it's a start of a, hopefully a, a conversation that leads us to actually implementing um, some policies. What have you put forward? Well, the first is following what we've just said. We are saying let's have an export processing zone in Nelson Mandela Bay Metro. This is one of the areas of the country with the highest unemployment rates. And we don't just have one, but we have two underutilized ports. So it's an ideal location for something like that. And we're saying this could be a place that's a special zone, which is designed to capture some of these jobs moving out of China, and which could employ unskilled workers. There are a number of preconditions for this mm. to be a success, because many of these zones around the world fail. South Africa's own IDZs failed. Yeah. So we need to be very careful that we get the ingredients right. There are a number of things, the w one of which is it would only be for export, okay. would be new investment, and employers would be able to negotiate wages with their employees. That's okay. the only way we can be globally competitive. Now before you start shouting at me, <laughs> as people do about this, South Africa has a little secret, which is we have one employer who's allowed to create low-skill, low-wage jobs in this country, and that's the government. We have an expanded public works program, program. that pays people below 80 rand a day, and we're saying a private sector job at that sort of rate or a little bit higher could be a much better job for somebody. Instead of picking up litter on the side of the road, you could get into a factory, you could get some training, you could start by sewing the T-shirt on your and my T-shirts, mm and soon you could make the whole t-shirt and then you could aspire to manage other people making the t-shirts. So you're on a sort of a on ladder a of path. opportunity yeah. which the expanded public works program does not offer. So the question is why do we allow the government to create those sorts of jobs and but not, not the, the private part. sector when those jobs will be better? I wish we had more time. I have to leave it there. Thanks for your time Thank today. You. Anne Bernstein is with the Centre for Development and Enterprise. Now, South African farmers are still struggling after the months-long drought affected crop yields. Some are turning to new technology to help meet their goals. These include devices that warn of extreme weather patterns many months in advance so that farmers can prepare for natural disasters. Technology is, uh, is, is moving far, farmers forward. Uh, without technology, they, they will be left behind. Farming used to be perceived as a lorry and rake operation. These days, however, farmers are turning to high-tech equipment and cellular technology to reap more from the seeds they sow. See the pivot? This is actual, it's got a GPS of the end of the machine, so it actually shows you the exact position of the machine. This arrow shows you in which, which direction it's going to move, and as you can see it's grey and white now, so it's standing, there's just power on the machine. So I'm going to tell the machine, okay, it's, it must start now. This irrigation system allows farmers to remotely monitor how much water is used on their crops. The frequency of irrigation can be controlled from a smart device like a phone or a tablet. And because it uses an international roaming system, the devices rarely lose connection, even in remote areas in the Northern Cape. It's about location-specific management. Different fields consist of different soil types. It's not only a physical difference, but a chemical one as well. Several factors are in play in each specific field which means every zone needs to be treated and managed individually. Other technologies like this plowing truck use GPS to water seeds at the exact spot they planted, ensuring a more consistent crop yield. The innovations don't come cheap though. The cellular system costs well over a million rand, while the trucks can retail for up to five and a half million rand. Mateo Kimberly. After the break, we